Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the very first kickoff episode of the Unidir uh, Launchpad Web Seminar Series. Um, we're really excited to be coming to you all today in your living rooms or in your kitchens, as you can see where I am, uh, or wherever it, wherever it is that you are. Uh, you know, in this in this crisis that we're having right now with COVID, I think it's really important that we continue to be able to to carry on these discussions. But we are, of course, moving on to a new format. And so in that sense, um, I would like to just drop a couple of quick ground rules for how we're going to be conducting this event today. Uh, and this should be quite exciting. Um, before we kick that off, though, uh, I would like to start out by asking you to take a poll. Uh, just a quick question. Um, you've all been answering this question here already. That's really great. Thank you for letting us know where you're tuning in from. Um, but I wanted to ask somebody or I wanted to ask the audience just before the outset, um, if I could ask our producers to head on over to the poll question. Um, you know, we're here today to talk about space situational awareness and space security. And as many of you know, one of the big issues that we try that we have to tackle with the prevention of an arms race in outer space is often what can we see, what can we measure, and what can we verify in outer space given our current technology. So if any of you would like to go over to the Multimedia viewer, you can please have a look at the activities uh, you people do. Now, speaking of ground rules, um, one thing that I must ask everyone to do I think we've muted everyone's microphones at the outset, and given that there are almost 300 participants. Um, I think it's going to be important that we only have one person speaking at a time. However, I can still hear some things from, from other folks. So, do come on. Yeah, if anybody would mind, uh, if anybody has their microphone on at the moment, please just mute that. Um, Merv, also, if I see you down there, uh, maybe you can just mute your microphone. Uh, thank you for that. So uh, at the outset, I would also like to remind everyone that we are recording this web seminar. So we are going to be uh, making this available later on so people can, uh, can watch and listen. So if you have any problems with that, um, uh, and you don't want to be recorded. Of course, only the speakers and the uh, and myself are going to be on mic. But um, just so everyone knows, this is going to be uh, made available at a later time. Uh, we are going to be doing the events in English. The Space Security Conference and most of our other events are typically in English. But given this new the new modalities, maybe sometime in the future we will have live interpretation. But haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, in order to get the best experience from this, I recommend that you use the side by side mode. You can click, I think it's up here uh, on most of your screens. Um, you can see that there are various different modes that you can use for WebEx to see things. And I have found that either the uh, side-by-side -side view is typically the best, um, or you can also use the, um, the video strip view, which is quite good. Uh, if you want to ask any questions of our speakers, we're going to have a multi, there's a multimedia viewer. You should already have that available. It's where you took the poll. But if you can't see it, you have a button should be right down about here that has three little dots on it. You can click there, and it will enable you to see the multimedia viewer. Uh, and finally, at the very end of the presentations, we are going to ask you all to uh, submit a uh, submit a, an evaluation form just to let us know how this experience went. So if you have any uh, questions or comments, you can give us feedback. Okay, and so with that, uh, Merv. I think we can close out the, the poll and have a quick look. Um, so as we can see here, there are quite a few activities that, um, that folks think we can, we can see in space. Would like to hand over to our presenter, uh, Ms. Victoria Sampson, who is the Washington Office Director for Secure World Foundation. Uh, Victoria Sampson has been working uh, with Secure World for quite some time and has been a, a very loyal partner of Unidir for quite some years. She and I have gotten to do many of these events in the past. So, Victoria, would you like to talk to us about space situational awareness and space security? Nothing would give me greater pleasure. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, as Daniel said, and my name is Victoria Sampson. I'm the Washington Office Director at the Secure World Foundation. The Secure World Foundation is a private operating foundation that focuses on the long-term sustainable use of space. We promote best practices and norms of behavior to make sure that space is usable and for and sustainable for all over the long term. Um, I would like to thank Unidir and FRS for their co-sponsorship of this um, webinar series. 
Um, as Daniel said, things are changing and we're trying to evolve how we do things along with it. But we are absolutely delighted that we've been able to have this webinar and that there's so much global interest in it. I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions and having the conversation later on. So I was asked just to do a quick overview of space situation awareness or SSA and how it relates to space security. So I'll be doing that, queuing up, and then um, the next presenter, Mary Bajal, will be talking at it from a technical viewpoint. As I always say, I'm a political scientist, not a real scientist, so I'll be focusing on the policy and law aspects of this. So SSA is information about the space environment and activities in space that can be used to um, operate safely and efficiently, avoid physical and electromagnetic interference, detect characterize and protect against threats, understand the evolution of the space environment, and provide awareness and transparency of space operations. Most space actors do not have the resources or the capacity to provide their own SSA. However, many states have some national capability that they can contribute to a broader effort. Achieving quote-unquote good SSA requires a large network of geographically distributed sensors and, and information from satellite owner operators. Therefore, it cannot be done by any one country working alone. You need to have government and private sector cooperation. SSA collaboration, cooperation, sharing is absolutely necessary for space security and s stability. Better SSA is pretty much a requirement for any space security agreement. That includes transparency and confidence building measures, or TCPMs, and norms, but also future treaties. For example, right now, there is no global agreement on what use of force in space is or a common understanding of how the laws of armed conflict apply to space. But if and when that is agreed to, SSA will be crucial for ascertaining where space activities fall. SSA is a key to clarifying whether dual use capabilities like rendezvous and proximity operations, active debris removal, or honorable servicing are being used in a benign or hostile fashion. Space technology is neutral. It's the use of which that can be either benign or aggressive. It is the intent, not the hardware, that is going to be the primary way to signal that actions in space are non-threatening, which raises a host of questions about what is needed to demonstrate responsible and non-hostile behavior on orbit. As well, Responsible space behavior can be a signal for good intent. Alternatively, reckless behavior in space can sometimes be a signal for malevolent intent, or at least lend itself to misinterpretation about the nature of a particular space asset. SSA can confirm whether space is being used in a responsible or irresponsible manner. Monitoring and verification like SSA can name and shame irresponsible actors. Also, SSA is important for indications and warnings of potential hostile threats or actions in space and is tied to identifying thresholds for self-defense. It gives you an idea of what is happening on orbit, but also I think we'll be pointing out, I think we will be talking about this as well, situational awareness is not 100%. It's not a crystal ball. It's not great. If a satellite stops working, it is not always clear why and whether it's due to deliberate interference, environmental issues, technical malfunction, or some other reason entirely. Um, SSA is important because um, there is a possibility of misunderstandings or mistrust. Um, actors could misinterpret an accident as a deliberate step to interfere with space capabilities if there are political issues or hostilities on the ground. So SSA is very important to hopefully avoid unnecessary crisis escalation. And then a little bit of stats about SSA. The United States Air Force maintains a catalog of about 24,000 objects, 10 centimeter in diameter or greater. Um, the, the Space Fence is a radar that just came online last, at the end of last year. As it continues to come online, the number is expected to go to at least 100,000 objects. Currently, um, in terms of active satellites, as of March 2020, there are about 2,600 active satellites. That is from the Union of Concerned Scientists Satellite Database, which I recommend everyone go check out if you're interested. It has a really great catalog of what we can see in terms of nation um, satellites and when they've been launched. 
mega constellations, which started launching last year, could add 50,000 more satellites to the over 2,600 satellites that are active currently. So you can see that's an order of magnitude increase, and that's a complicated picture for SSA. And then with um, the advent of new actors in space, a lot of them are using small sats as they get used to working on orbit. And um, these small sats provide their own SSA challenge, whether they're even big enough to be trackable. Um, and if they're trackable, are they actually maneuverable in that if the, you identify a potential close approach to them, can you actually get the satellite out of the way? Um, some small satellites are launched with the inability to actually move once they're on orbit. They depend upon being pulled back into Earth's gravity to deorbit. In terms of who's in charge of SSA, largely speaking, no one is in charge of SSA. Um, nations have their own SSA capabilities. Um, the United States, historically, that has been the U.S. military, now the 18th Space Control Squadron. Um, previously, there hadn't been really a distinction between military SSA and non-military SSA. The Trump administration issued Space Policy Directive 3 in June of 2018. This declared the Department of Commerce would be the lead for civil SSA. However, the United States Congress has not given the Department of Commerce the additional authorities and budget to implement the full scope of SPD-3. In any case, right now, the 18th Space Control Squadron has one over 100 SSA sharing agreements. Uh, Russia has a very strong SSA network, and the Europeans are developing their SST space surveillance network. As well, Japan and India are investing in their capabilities. And also, just to point out, you don't need to have a whole network to have SSA capabilities. Um, Owner-operator information can qualify as SSA information, as well as information from um, single telescopes, as long as they're good ones. I would also like to emphasize as well that commercial SSA is growing in capability and at times surpasses what government networks can do. So its presence should be noted and those capabilities should be incorporated when discussing how do we use SSA for stability measures. National, regional, and international initiatives at SSA can contribute to stability in space for all. The stability is of great strategic value. And then when you're talking about SSA, what is the end point? What are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve space flight safety? Are you trying to use it as a verification measure? Are you trying to use it for transparency? No matter what the end goal is, I think there's a general agreement about the need to get a baseline level of information to all satellite operators for spaceflight safety and predictability in orbit, which helps shore up space security and stability. I will add very briefly, and we can talk about this more in the question section if people are interested, anti-satellite tests that create debris stress current SSA capabilities. And I would like to um, end with the, the warning uh, that SSA is not perfect. Um, keep that in mind, please, when thinking about how it can be used as a TCBM. Um, it can be challenged by multiple satellites being launched at the same time, maneuvers on orbit, et cetera. The US government cannot currently routinely monitor and track everything in space. Its SSA is largely based on looking back in time and predicting for the future. Combined for the fact that it's not able to ingest planned maneuvers, for example, their predictions are sometimes off. So again, I bring up the caveat because I think sometimes the policy folks think, okay, there's a technical solution and we can depend on that 100%. And in this case, it is part of the solution, but it cannot be the only solution to figuring out transparency and stability in space. And so that's a larger question. How do you achieve transparency in space? How do you, and what role can norms play possibly including SSA verification and establishing a stable and predictable space environment. And with that, I think I'll stop and turn it over to Mariba. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Victoria, for that. Um, and I think that's a really great kicking off point. Uh, and so that you raise a lot of really good questions that we're gonna come at uh, from a policy side. But now we wanna talk a little bit to Mariba so he can tell us more about the, the technical side of space situational awareness and what it is exactly that, you know, what, what people do so that they can see things in space and what it is that we can see in outer space. And so with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Marie Bajaw from the University of Texas. He is, a, uh, he is an astrophysicist, an astrodynamicist, and all around uh, gentleman and scholar. So with that, uh, a man who needs no introduction, Dr. Marie Bajaw. <laughs> well, uh... Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Victoria. Um, hopefully people can hear me. Yes, if I can get a... We can hear you loud and clear, sir. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so... Um, 
I'm, I'm currently uh, an associate professor of space engineering and engineering mechanics at the University of Texas uh, at Austin, and I lead a research program uh, focused on space safety, security, and sustainability, of which you know space situational awareness is is a, is a nice aspect of that. I think um, what I want to say is the following, because Victoria did a very good job uh, laying down kind of some definitions uh, that you could consider for space situational awareness, and uh, she gave some statistics on things that are tracked and that sort of stuff. So I, I like to think about the space domain uh, in near Earth with three main themes. <clears throat> Theme number one is that uh, near Earth space is geopolitically contested. So we've seen this from, you know, since the Cold War and, you know, Sputnik and all these things. And, and we've seen that uh, three dominant countries uh, have now, you know, more and more uh, countries are, are uh, acting in space and, and, and doing all sorts of, uh, you know, activities and their own national interests. So that's not changed. Uh, theme number two is that uh, near Earth space is commercially contested. And so we've seen uh, a new space race, a new bonanza gold rush. Um, we know from outer space treaty, uh, you know, res communis, there's no, there's, there are no titles or deeds uh, for orbital space. Uh, but that, you know, notwithstanding that, it's, you know, here in the United States, there's a term called squatter's rights. Uh, and, and some people may be familiar with this, and really, it's a first come, first served in, in, in a great sense. Uh, let me put it this way. Physics tells us that when two things occupy the same space at the same time, uh, sometimes bad things can happen as a result. And so, uh, you know, if we have objects that are occupying a specific orbital region, and if the carrying capacity and I'll, and I'll get to this here in a little bit, if the carrying capacity of that orbital habitat or region is saturated, then you can't put more stuff there. So that, which brings me to the third theme, which is near Earth space uh, is a finite resource. And, uh, you know, all of outer space may be infinite, but near Earth space is finite. It's a finite resource. Uh, we don't launch things just anywhere in space. We put things on very specific column orbital highways, and the, the carrying capacity of these orbital highways can become saturated, at which point you can't put more stuff there. Uh, there's no cleaning crew to come and sweep things away, even though you have Astroscale, you have some other companies that are trying to build business models. You have Clear Space, which is going to launch something there, you know, for, uh, they're at EP, led it at EPFL with Muriel Richards that's going to launch something in 2025 to rendezvous with this Vespa payload adapter. So you have some folks looking at that, but currently there's no space sweeping uh, uh, or clearing of these orbital highways. So near Earth space is in desperate need of environmental protection, okay? Desperate need of environmental protection. Norms of behavior for sustainability, uh, the World Economic Forum has been developing this thing called a space sustainability rating to try to incentivize launchers and, 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 and space actors to behave uh, responsibly uh, in a way that would lead to sustainability. So these are all things that are taking place. So again, the themes are space is geopolitically contested, space is commercially contested, and near-Earth space is in desperate need of environmental protection. So yesterday I was interviewed, I won't say uh, by who, but, but they were asking me about the risks. Uh, what are the risks in space? And I said, uh, you know, I don't wanna just look at things in terms of, um, you know, conjunction and collisions. Uh, let's start trying to quantify these risks against these three S's. You know, we have space safety, we have sustainability, and the thing that most people uh, tend to gloss over is the security piece. And, and I would say that from a technical perspective, the information requirements uh, that would go against space safety issues like collisions, uh, you know, we have radars, we have telescopes uh, that collect observations. And so uh, I'll, I'll put it this way. You can't manage what you don't know 
and you don't know what you don't measure. Okay? Can't manage what you don't know, don't know what you don't measure. So it all comes down to measurements. If we're not measuring things in the environment, if we're not measuring the environment, we can't possibly know that environment. And so we can't manage that. There is no space traffic management without, without space traffic knowledge. And there's no space traffic knowledge without space traffic measurements. So it's all about these observations. And there is no global, uh, globally accessible, shareable pool of space traffic measurements to then infer the knowledge, to then get to the management piece, which is the big deal. Um, but, but, but you know, very briefly to close up here before we can open things up to, to more dialogue and questions, <clears throat> the requirements for collisions uh, is not as much as the requirements to, say, reconcile some sort of dispute in space. People, by and large, think that space security is just about intelligence agencies or militaries and things like that. And I think that that's, uh, to put it mildly, ridiculous and naive. You know, just looking at two companies, let's say SpaceX and Amazon, not that this would happen, but, you know, uh, no, there's been no domain of human uh, interaction, of human activity that's been absent malicious intent. To think that two companies up there that are big competitors, that it's impossible for one of them to behave uh, maliciously towards the other, I think that's naive. And the thing is, it's probably happened. It definitely will happen, especially given theme two that I said space is commercially contested. There's a lot of money to be made or lost uh, in that domain, and it's mostly unmonitored. I will say that the 18th does a really great job in having this catalog of like 26,000 objects that Victoria spoke about, right? But it's not pervasive monitoring. This whole thing of Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty about continuing supervision uh, that states have responsibility for, nobody continuously supervises anything. Uh, we just had an experiment uh, that happened successfully, MEV-1, uh, rendezvoused with this satellite and GEO, right? And, and now this thing is attached to the satellite and, and gave it like extra life and that sort of thing. I can tell you that people were observing that from all over the world as possible. And there was a certain point far away where they couldn't distinguish the two objects anymore with telescopes. It was like one kilometer. Okay. Now, have you ever looked out your window to see how far one kilometer is? It's not that close. What could happen within one kilometer that everybody else couldn't perceive? If we want for space to be secure, then the observations and the monitoring that we have, we have to have a body of evidence where we could reconcile any disputes, a ledger of a sequence of events so that we could say, this is what A did to B all throughout this timeline. And at any point, if that becomes ambiguous, we're in big trouble. So I'm gonna stop there for now, but needless to say, this is an iceberg uh, type of topic, which I'm happy to dive deeper into. And thank you very much. Yeah, the, I can tell that we're going to have a lot of uh, a lot of good discussion today because, as always, Victoria and Mariba are bringing their A game and raising a lot of really good issues. Um, in order for everyone to to be able to ask questions, I just want to remind you: um, just check the multimedia viewer. Uh, if you can't see it in your screen, uh, there's a button that should be right about here. I think on most of you, it's got uh, three little dots, and if you just poke that. It'll bring up the multimedia viewer uh, over to the right of your screen, and then you can enter the questions there at the bottom. Um, but being the, the host of this meeting, uh, I'm going to take my prerogative and be the first to ask a, a couple of questions. Um, first one is for Victoria. Victoria, are you there? Sure. Okay. Maybe, maybe the first question then will be from Mariba. Mariba, at the very beginning, we showed a quick poll that had a, a Bunch of different activities on it that you know, and we asked, are these things that we can measure and detect and potentially track in space? Uh, of that list, how many of those things do you think uh, are technically trackable, observable, and verifiable today? Yeah. So um, here's the thing, right? Uh, anything that relates to uh, anything that relates to where objects are located. That's usually what, what we can 
uh, assess, right? So locations of things in the sky, mostly because of radars and telescopes, these things, uh, some, some of these are, are actively being measured, others are just kind of listening passively, like telescopes are just looking at reflected light off of surfaces of objects. So when it comes to location type stuff, um, usually those are the things that are measurable that might be verifiable. And like I said, I, I gave the example of this MEV1 rendezvous, which you know, within one kilometer, uh, people just couldn't distinguish uh, the difference between the two objects, yikes. Um, in terms of other things that aren't, uh, aren't measurable by like these telescopes, for instance, like radio frequency interference. So telescopes won't be able to assess anything about radio frequency oh. interference, for instance. So these are the things where we have to say, okay, what are the things that people care about? Uh, and, and given the things that, that people care about, if we want to know about these things, what are the things that I would, I would have to measure to be able to, to get to know, you know, how this is happening or to, to what extent, and then focus on those measurements being available to a group of people that could independently corroborate uh, th those sorts of activities, those sorts of issues. Okay. And I mean, now that we've just got, gone ahead and, uh, and opened that, is it, are we able to see and observe things in all the orbits the same? Like, do we have the low Earth orbit, the medium Earth orbit, and the geosynchronous orbit? Are our capabilities to see things in those areas the same across the board, or are they different for different orbits? Yeah, so, so I, I thank you for that. So th they are different. Um, these are different orbital habitats uh, with, with, and, and the species of, of space objects that live in these habitats behave differently based on that uh, local space environment, that habitat. And so for low Earth orbit, it tends to be, uh, you know, radars are, are tend to be the more effective things. Telescopes uh, require nighttime conditions mostly and that sort of thing. Uh, telescopes don't see well through clouds, so there is that, but that's just kind of a common thing. But the dynamics, how things move and behave in that environment, make it uh, very nuanced in how to observe those things versus something at geo, which is fairly fixed uh, uh, with respect to an observer. But at the same time, things at geo, it means that uh, only, only, only parts of the Earth that fall directly under that geo region can observe it. But, you know, people that live on the other side of the globe can't see that region of geo. I can't, I hear from Austin, Texas, cannot see the region of geo that is above China, for instance, and that sort of thing. So, but a low Earth orbit satellite that might belong to China, uh, eventually it'll come over the United States because of the dynamics of the habitat. So these things are nuanced and it's not kind of a Lord of the Rings, one, one, one uh, observation system to rule them all that will actually work. Okay, great. Victoria, are you there? So, hello. There you are. Um, hello. There's, there's been a word that has gotten thrown around a few times now and I, I wanna circle back to it so, so you can really highlight the the danger behind this word, and that word is verification. We often hear about verification and why it's important to, to discussions on, on space security. Can you just tell us a little bit about what verification is and why it's important to, to what we're working on? Sure, I mean, verification comes out of arms control and disarmament discussions, right? Um, and so it's the idea that uh, you have some sort of agreements, and usually it's a legally binding agreement or treaty, um, and there is a way to have outside, as Marie has talked about, outside very, uh, independently uh, agreed upon the, um, observation and confirmation um, that the behavior of the treaty or what have you is being followed the way that the parties agreed to. Um, and so that makes sense, I think, in some contexts for arms control and disarmament. Uh, when you're talking nuclear weapons, for example, you can, you know, part of the verification process is that you go and you see, okay, um, how much nuclear material do they have? How mm -hmm. much, um, are, what are they doing with their, um, the, you can visit sites and see, okay, have they got the ICBMs mated together with the warheads, that sort of thing. You can actually go and physically see these things. Uh, basically, a verification, historically, forms control disarmament, has looked at a technological response. Um, it's technology doing what you agree to either would or would not be doing. Um, the, the difference we run into for space is that verification is going to be different because the space technology is essentially the same. Um, a satellite that can be used for monitoring 
crop plant crop growth and plantation can be used for spying and intelligence gathering. So it's not necessarily the hardware you're looking at, it's the behavior. And so uh, th there's a, that seems like a nuance was an important one because when you're talking verification for um, activities in orbit, you have to say, okay, what behavior am I, am, I, am I finding threatening? And so that's where we run into issues because even though we've been in space for some time, there still isn't really 100% agreement across the board in terms of, okay, here's a series of uh, actions on, on orbit that we find okay, and here is a series that we all agree to we would find threatening. Um, and so when you're talking verification, what exactly are you trying to verify? And so I think oftentimes when we're trying to focus on the security and stability aspects of space, we want to jump ahead, you know, jump five steps down the line and talk verification and treaties and that sort of thing. We, we need to back up. We need to figure out what are we trying to accomplish? What do we consider to be responsible behavior in orbit? What do we consider threatening behavior in orbit? And then we can go on and say, okay, how do we verify that this behavior is either being followed or not being followed and, and go from there. Let, let me go ahead and just follow that up with uh, maybe, maybe the next logical question, which is you, know, you mentioned that you should think what are the norms first and then try and figure out if, if they're verifiable. I mean, given we've been discussing, and you and I have been engaged in a lot of topics and discussions that have covered uh, a host of behaviors or technologies. Mm -hmm. Of everything that has come up, uh, are there any specific areas or any specific types of behaviors or technologies that you do think could be the subject of a verifiable agreement? I'm not saying whether it's legally binding or politically binding, um, but just is there are there any activities that you think, yeah, that's something that if we set a rule up for it, um, we we could check it and make sure that people are adhering to their obligations. Well, I mean, yeah, it's. Um... I think there's possibilities for behavior. You can see, okay, we can verify whether or not that behavior is being followed. Um, you know, for example, a very obvious one is: Are you cr deliberately creating debris in orbit with an anti-satellite test? That's pretty much something you can verify one way or the other. Um, you know, someone launches a, a, a ground-based ASAT, it hits the satellite, creates debris in orbit. Um, other people are going to see the debris. It, it's not going to be a secret. Um, I'd like to point out that in 2007, when China had their um, anti-satellite tests, um, the way that the global community found out about it was because amateur satellite observation people were watching the skies and said, huh, that's weird. There was an object there, and then suddenly there's a bunch of objects over there. Something must have happened there. And so they were the ones that came out and said, okay, that you probably should look into this. Um, I would just like to point out that um, you know, as much as people might like to think so, or governments like to think so, act, act, actions on orbit can be misunderstood, but people can see them. Um, and so I think oftentimes there's um, a, a wish to make a lot of things secret, and maybe that made sense a couple decades ago when there wasn't widespread technologies. But when people can go and point their phones up at the sky and see, okay, what that satellite is, I think that a lot of this um, secrecy is gone. It's, it's no longer an option. So that might be an option. But as well, you can have discussions about acti actions in orbit that are threatening or non-threatening. And that's where you come up and say, OK, what do we think about for things like close approach or rendezvous and proximity operations? Um, and that's where I think the commercial sector has really led the way in discussing what they um, see as being responsible behavior in orbit. Um, as well, um, I think it's important to kind of bring in the commercial sector in these discussions. I know that there's a larger reluctance to do so because from security reasons, um, they want to be held under, uh, you know, under the guise of nation state discussion points. But uh, the commercial sector is very obviously going to be part of this conversation one way or the other. Um, and again, I'd like to emphasize looking at the launch of all these mega constellations, um, you know, it's not nation states that are launching these constellations. It is the commercial sector. And so it's probably as uncomfortable as a lot of the multilateral fora are with bringing in non-state actors. There has to be some way to incorporate them in this conversation. Yeah, Daniel. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I love everything that, that Victoria said. Uh, I, th I think to... To add on a, a few things to what she said uh, and, and, and what you asked, for sure I can tell you this, right? 
Uh, in terms of low-hanging fruit and, and, and what we should verify, I would start with the B mitigation. Just like what Victoria said, uh, you know, when people del deliberate, deliberately creating debris and that sort of thing is one thing. But I would even say just compliance and non-compliance with, uh, you know, debris mitigation guidelines that the IEDC has put out, that uh, the UN COPOS, you know, um, has put out in terms of LTS guidelines. We should have, a, a, you know, in the public square, we should have evidence of who is complying and who is not complying with these guidelines and just let the public kind of uh, weigh in on the opinion on, on what they think about this. Again, near Earth space is a finite resource. The biggest problem with debris and, and, and these sorts of things uh, is that we have a high percentage of non-compliance and European Space Agency and other entities know about this, except that that's not necessarily public. That needs to be public. Uh, different people from across the globe need to be looking at the evidence, providing a combined uh, set of observations where, where uh, you know, people from around the globe can infer that stuff. I think uh, that's something that we should look at low-hanging fruit and that we, we should be able to do. The other thing, too, when, when Victoria was talking about, um, you know, RPO, you know, commerce is leading the way. I fully agree with that. Um, commercial entities it would be in their best interest to have independent monitoring of their own actions to cover their their own uh you know rear end so to speak if 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 you know when the rubber kind of hits the road and what i mean by that is this if there are two companies one of them is trying to do some rendezvous with another one to refuel it or any of these things i think just from a legal perspective it's in their best interest to say how many other people can observe what it is that I'm doing so that there's this independent body of evidence so that this, you know, if something happens that we didn't expect or whatever, you know, person A can't just go and say, hey, you know, these people did this to me and it was on purpose and all this other stuff. If it wasn't and there's evidence that it, that it wasn't, boy, that would surely be nice. So I think uh, commercial companies, they kind of tend to be out in front of the headlights uh, from my perspective in terms of regulation and that sort of stuff. And they just wanna go, go, go. But I think they should really think about, hey, uh, uh, from a legally uh, responsible uh, and liable kind of perspective, maybe it makes sense for as many people to be observing me and I should make myself as observable as possible so that there's this independent body of evidence that, that, that could be used uh, in case there are any issues. Thanks, man. <laughs> you always give me a lot to think about. Um, and we've actually got a lot of questions that are, that are coming in from the audience, and I want to see if we can try and discuss uh, some of these. Um, and I know that you guys have been, been answering them quite a lot. Um, Victoria, there's a question for you here. Uh, you mentioned the space situational awareness capabilities for the US, Russia, um, and there's also Japan and India, but not China. Um, what what types of uh do we know what types of ssa capabilities china has and do they share any of that information um yeah i mean obviously as a space operator they have some of their own ssa capabilities um for specifics just because i want, don't want to get into a really long technical um, conversation um right now um i would actually direct um anyone who's interested to secure world foundation's website we have a counter space threat assessment document um, which can be found at swffound.org slash counterspace. Um, and we go into U.S., Russia, China, um, India, North Korea, Iran, um, France, Japan. Uh, we look at, we look discuss their SSA capabilities um, specifically. So you can find more information there. Um, obviously, we know specifics about China's SSA capabilities. Technical specs are not really shared. And to my knowledge, they are not involved in any um, external SSA sharing. Um, I believe that they um, just use it for their own purposes. But again, I would direct you to the swfound.org slash counterspace to read more about that document. And I'm always happy to answer questions later on if you have more after reading that. Marie, but that actually uh, has a good follow on for you as well. Uh, because, and I know that your, your Astria graph system depends on um, SSA data from a number of sources. Um, this question is, are there any international forums, at least between Russia, China, and the U.S., to discuss SSA data exchange 
or anything similar? If not, is it because of lack of awareness or space, space issues or active objection? I think maybe that refers to political objection. But maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you've gotten uh, you know, countries like the US and Russia to give you data, um, and if you've tried to maybe reach out to China in the past. Yeah, no, thank you for that. So I would say, you know, uh, the I, at the IADC, uh, you know, the IADC is, is governments uh, meeting and, and talking with each other. Uh, I've never been to uh, one of those meetings, never been invited to one of those. That's like that's a separate that's webinar that's we should have maybe. Yeah, that's uh, the, debris, <laughs> the interagency debris committee. Uh, so yes. Lots of space, space agencies get together and talk about space debris. Absolutely no, and thank you for, for thank you for the, for clarifying that for for the audience. Um, so I know that one of their working groups is on measurements, and they discuss these things. Um, but when I speak to some of the IADC people, in terms of actual like sensor observations, those typically don't get exchanged in that form. And really, that's what we need. We need to be able to share the measurements, the observations, uh, you know, of of things in the domain, in the environment, and that sort of stuff. I can tell you that uh, this astrograph uh, uh, project that, that I've been leading, um, so, so far, you know, we've had, uh, you know, JSC Vimple uh, catalog from the Russians. Uh, they have been happy to share that with us, and that gets updated every, every couple of weeks. Um, we also have some owner-operated data from, like, Planet. Uh, Planet has been very, very uh, forward-leaning and providing us with ephemeris, of where their satellites are located and all these other things. We've started getting some uh, data from SpaceX as well on their Starlink satellites. Um, Leo Labs provides us uh, some free radar measurements on some subset of objects for scientific purposes, non-commercial purposes. And they even have their own opinions now about where some of these things are located. So we get to ingest those. Um, more from Russia, I'll tell you that um, I'm actually partnering with the International Scientific Optical Network, or ISON. Uh, we actually share a telescope in New Mexico. Uh, you know, the, 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 the Keldish Institute of Applied Math and UT Austin have signed a, a, a memorandum of understanding where we share a telescope in New Mexico. So that's a really cool thing. Uh, in terms of uh, collaborations with, with India, I can tell you that one of my telescopes uh, we just signed a, a, a memorandum of understanding with the Indian Space Research Organization. So one of my telescopes is going to be shipped to India within the next few months. Uh, they actually came from India to do this, the final signing here at UT Austin, which was really awesome. It happened during the Space Traffic Management uh, Conference, as you know, that we have here every year at Austin. So that was great. Um, with China, uh, that is a bit more nuanced. Uh, it turns out that the Chinese Academy of Sciences has a national astronomical observatories. I've started dialogues with some of these astronomers, people looking at debris and that sort of thing, because they do have some telescopes. Some of it is laser tracking. And so I haven't gotten any of their data yet, uh, but, but I'm hopeful uh, that we'll get to that point, uh, hopefully sometime this calendar year. I think people are starting to add and add more observations to the system and i think it's going to be to everybody's benefit because again it's independently corroborated evidence about what's going on out there and really getting to this idea of how do we supervise and monitor uh behaviors and activities in a domain victoria this is another question that um i think both of you will have uh, plenty to say about it but let me start with you um the military more or less leads the SSA efforts. Um, I think most of us are aware that the US Air Force is the main one who, uh, who provides SSA data at the moment. Um, but we're starting to see a lot more other uh, actors who are getting involved in this area. So how can we refocus the space situational awareness mission to be more civilian led as opposed to military led? Yep. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a really good question. Um, Excuse me. Um, within the United States, there has been a discussion for some time about who should be in charge of SSA. Just because SSA sharing, as you said, is being done by led by the United States Air Force, but that is really kind of a secondary mission. I mean, really monitoring what's up in the skies uh, on orbit that came out of Cold War considerations, where the U.S. was monitoring, let's be honest, the North Pole to see if there are Soviet ICBMs coming over it. And um, as an aside, they're like, "Oh yeah, we can also." keep track of these space objects, okay, we'll do that too. But it was never really a primary mission. Um, 
and then sharing the SSA data, which they've been doing um, for over a decade now, that again, it's, it's done for spaceflight safety, um, but it's not a, necessarily a national security mission for them. And so there's a discussion in the United States, so how do we get this so it can be, have a different head? Um, and that's something that we've, we're still working out. Um, as I said before, uh, there was a dispute about which, which not civilian organization should be involved. Um, should it be Department of Commerce? Should it be the FAA? At one point, the FCC was offering to be involved in it. Um, so we're still starting that out. Um, but I think it just it comes to the larger discussion about whether SSA should be civil or military in nature. I mean, I guess the question is, you know, it's it's a public good essentially, and so I would argue there's a certain baseline sort of SSA that everyone needs to be able to have, whether you're a military actor, whether you're um, a civilian actor, whether you're a commercial actor, what have you. And and then on top of that, what do you need your SSA for? Do you need it to be able to do exquisite monitoring of treaty behavior? Or are you trying to make sure your satellite just doesn't bump into a piece of debris? Or um, are you trying to do some sort of, um, you know, on-orbit servicing or refueling a satellite in orbit, which requires to be able to get up and get close? So there's a, it, it comes down to what are you trying to accomplish with your SSA? And so I think in general, the, the problem we run into is, is classification precludes a lot of data sharing and then just, you know, it sounds goofy, but, you know, formatting across different networks is often a challenge as well. Um, we've seen that if you ever try to switch from a Mac to a PC, it can be, you know, it should be easy transition, but it often is not. And so it's just a larger conversation about the need to have these international discussions where you bring in all the stakeholders, not just the ones that have the SSA powers um, and capabilities, but those who use SSA to make sure that the owner operators are familiar with the information and that they can share it across the board. Um, and we've already seen this done. There have already been a couple um, commercial entities. The Space Data Association, for example, um, set up a way to share SSA data within the organization. Um, and so, and you can imagine, okay, if these guys are competitors on the marketplace and yet they find that they can comfortably share SSA data, again, for a space flight safety sort of thing, then we should be able to do it around, you know, globally. But again, it requires a conversation about what you're trying to accomplish and how do you go about doing it. So I think it's encouraging that there is a definite interest globally in this issue because you can't fix, we don't acknowledge as a problem. So we're, we're, we're starting there. Now we have to figure out where do we go from here. Yeah, so, so, so Daniel, the quick thing that I just wanted to say following up with what Victoria said is, I think what we need in general is kind of a ways a ways uh, type application for space. And so what I mean is, I think the basic, the very basic SSA capability should be like a ways for space where you can kind of see what are the general kind of traffic patterns and these sorts of things to help people navigate and steer around that space traffic as much as possible for kind of safety and security reasons and that sort of thing. But then, you know, uh, for commerce, Okay, for people to make money, to, to not destroy the marketplace for, for, for you know, commercial SSA providers, that sort of stuff. As you know, in Waze, there's a lot of information, but at the same time, you don't necessarily know the identity of every vehicle on the road in Waze. You don't know that this is a semi versus this is a Vespa versus this is that or the other. And so there is an ability that given that fundamental kind of Waze for Space type app, there's an ability for commercial SSA folks to leverage that and actually provide more exquisite knowledge uh, that, that could be charged, uh, people could charge a fee for. So, so I think that there's a way to provide that basic level of understanding uh, for free, and then on top of that, uh, allow people to leverage that uh, to make businesses uh, uh, you know, off of that sort of capability. Excellent. Sir, I'm gonna ask you, one other uh, just one other question for for both of you and then i want to do a, a final poll but for you good sir <laughs> artificial intelligence what role might it play in in space situational awareness no th thank you for that so here's the the first thing that i want to say is this um the thing about ai and machine learning is that uh, uh they assume that tomorrow looks like today and so if your version of today uh, is pretty crappy and and not not w without a lot of resolution and, and, and finite you know very kind of uh, uh, good knowledge 
then the prediction of tomorrow is going to be lousy. So it's a garbage in, garbage out kind of thing. You know, AI and ML is not all sentient. It's kind of dumb. So you got to train the thing. Um, so, so you want to feed it lots of todays, lots of different todays over years and all that stuff so that tomorrow's prediction can be as, you know, as accurate and as precise as possible. Um, one of the things that space is missing is a big data problem. There is no big data problem in space for SSA. And I think that that is to our detriment. Big data, science and analytics works really well in other domains, you know, uh, pandemics, like all these other things, right? But we don't have a big data problem in space. And every time I, I raise this, I hear people say, oh, but sure we do. You know, I have terabytes and terabytes of telescope observations. And I tell them that's not big data, that's a lot of data. It's not the same thing. Big data are lots of data from very disparate and different sources. And the thing is, in order for us to get the best picture of space, we need to combine all these disparate sources, and then we can start discovering causal relationships between entities in the domain, and then train AI and ML on those things to help the human out. The AI needs to complement uh, human cognition, not replace it. Uh, and so I think the way that people think about this needs to be very different. It's not this automated thing that you just flip the switch and out comes the answer, no. It needs to complement human cognition, and the training set needs to be on a big data problem, which we currently do not have a big data problem in space. Nobody, nobody has a big data problem in space. Daniel, I know you had a question for me as well. I just want to jump in on Mariba's response. Mm -hmm. um, okay. AI can also be helpful in terms of analyzing and making the data in a format that is usable for operators and owners and operators. Um, I know it, oftentimes when people get information about potential close approaches, they're not sure exactly what am I supposed to do with this? You know, how do I understand this? And that's where AI can help kind of build in some sort of uh, understanding about what do you do with the, the data? It's not enough to have it. It's ability to analyze it and make it useful. Excellent. Okay. Well, in that case, in, I think we're pretty much starting to run out of time here. And I know we've, we've given folks a lot of information. Um, but at this point, I want to ask the same question that we just had, uh, or that we asked at the very beginning of the, of the meeting, and just to see if folks still feel the same way that they did about, uh, about some of these different topics and what we might actually be able to measure or verify with, current, uh, with the current technology. Uh, and while y'all are doing that, one, I would, <laughs> to do a little promotion for our own work, uh, Unidir did do a paper on this topic of space situational awareness and space security last year uh, called Eyes in the Sky. It's file four for the space dossier. So if any of y'all would like to check that out, highly recommend that you go to our website and look that up, um, where we also talk quite a bit about what might be the possible subjects of uh, agreements that could also potentially be verifiable. And that, of course, is important so that states can feel confident that any obligations that might be picked up, whether they be legal or political in nature, are actually being adhered to. Um, in addition, I want to thank our speakers uh, for coming, Victoria and Mariba. They've done a really great job today. Uh, I would also like to thank our co-sponsors, um, the Secure World Foundation and the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique, uh, as well as the European Union and the Swiss government. Uh, and then, of course, some of our other funders, um, such as the Russian Federation, New Zealand, and Swedish governments. They've all been really helpful. Uh, and, of course, our consultants, Reese McCann, who um, are doing a great job in making this a little bit extra special meeting. Um, finally, I would like to remind everyone that we're going to be doing these web seminars once a week. Uh, so Wednesdays at 2 o'clock. Uh, next Wednesday, we're going to be doing another, uh, another presentation with, uh, about cyber warfare in space. That's going to be featuring um, Beza Unal from the Chatham House, who I'm sure many of you know. And of course, my very dear friend, Raji Rajagopalan from the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi. Um, and so with that, uh, Merv, if we can just uh, have a quick look again at the results from the slides, um, just so that everyone can have a quick look. Um, yeah, and I think that's interesting. We've definitely seen that a lot more of the uh, of the choices have grouped around certain uh, certain activities. So I think that that is an eye opener. And moreover, what's interesting is what people are not doing, um, because that kind of shows that we still have some limitations in where space situational awareness can, can continue to grow. Um, so we've got another five minutes. Um, Victoria, Mariba, would you like to just wrap up with anything? Or I can certainly shoot you a couple more questions that the audience has put to us uh, before we wrap up. 
I'm fine with I'm the audience, audience, audience questions. Yeah. Okay. Well, in that case, let me just shoot you a, a couple more. Um, Riva, uh, we have talked about a number of countries that have put up a, a fair bit of debris in the past um, and that we're still tracking. Um, can you tell us where most of where a lot of that debris comes from? Like, what is it? Is it are they you know, old satellites? Are they old rocket parts? Um, junk that's floating around? Yeah, yeah. So, so look, I mean, uh, part of it is you know so-called mission-related debris, which for years, whenever you'd put a satellite up there, you know, you'd have these explosive bolts, and so uh, you know, you'd have covers on cameras that would be popped off. So, so that's that mission related debris, things related to, to just normal kind of operations, uh, I think people in general have been saying, yeah, let's try to minimize that or, or not have that uh, at all. So some of it is that. Uh, certainly uh, when things die up there, most of the stuff that dies up there never comes back. And so that uh, pretty much uh, is effectively debris, large rocket bodies, these sorts of things. Uh, every once in a while, a couple of things will, uh, again, occupy the same space at the same time you know, kaboom, uh, that becomes smaller pieces. Uh, sometimes things explode. We've seen some upper stages and geotransfer orbits uh, apparently explode uh, in the past couple of years that's generated many, many thousands of objects, unfortunately, in geotransfer orbits. So, so this, is, this is kind of the behavior of, of the population. We don't fully understand the aging process of stuff. You know, space object gerontology. Yep, I just made it. It's a thing that I just made up. But understanding how things age and how they deteriorate and flake off and, and this and kind of become dismembered. Uh, uh, sorry for, for kind of such a graphic kind of, uh, uh, kind of thing. But yeah, we don't understand that yet. So there's more science that needs to be done there. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Victoria, here's another one of those million dollar questions for you. Can you, do you envision a future system where SSA data will be gathered from all international actors uh, with one sort of mediating entity in the middle acting as a clearinghouse to send out data to everyone else? Do you think that's possible? I mean, nothing's impossible. <laughs> um, but in the minute I have left, I would just caution that um, have one global entity being involved in sending information out as a database, it would be nice, but I think probably unrealistic given situations um, actors have about the, the secrecy of the data, whether it's from a national security viewpoint, from a commercial viewpoint, or what have you. Um, I think it's probably likely to be best to say networks where they coordinate information across the board um, and then share information that way. And I think that can be a multipolar world, going back to my um, international relations training uh, for SSA data sharing, I think that can be as stable as a unipolar world. Um, it's just a matter of, do you have confidence in information, whether or not one entity is in charge of if, if sharing it out or if it's gonna be shared out via a bunch of different entities. Do you have confidence in information um, and can you trust it? Um, that's going to probably be, be a larger hurdle to clear than figuring out who's going to be sharing, sharing it out. Okay, excellent. Um, and just as someone who has done a lot of work on, on that particular subject as well, uh, I think I would also add that I, I do prefer having many entities who can cross-check each other uh, as opposed to just having one, you know, because that way it just kind of keeps everyone honest. But with that, ladies and gentlemen, it's 3 o'clock. We have come to the end of our first of episode one of the Launchpad seminars. I hope you've all taken something interesting away from this. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, let us know. We, um, I think we have a, an evaluation form that we've set up. Uh, and if we don't put, get out the link now, we'll just send it to you in the next couple of days. We really appreciate any feedback you've got and hope that everyone is staying safe and secure in their, uh, in their respective lockdown. So thanks again to everyone. Reba, Victoria, thanks again. Booyah, booyah. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. And thank you, Daniel.